Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist working in Alaska for the summer, but I do most of my work in the Eastern Woodlands region of the United States. I've been excavating and studying, and in some cases teaching in this area or that area, for over 10 years, mostly dealing with the indigenous cultures that lived there prior to colonization by Europeans. Now, I've had a few questions about professional archaeology pop up recently, and I thought it might be useful to explain how all of that works in the U.S. Uh, specifically. Every country has its own set of historic preservation laws, so this definitely doesn't apply everywhere. So keep that in mind. Now, the bulk of the archaeology that gets done in the U.S. is an industrial process. It happens outside of the purview of the university system entirely. We have a, a bunch of historic preservation laws in this country, but the big one is called the National Historic Preservation Act, or uh, the NHPA, from 1966. And under that act, any time that there is federal money involved in any kind of ground-disturbing project, there has to be a cultural resources impact assessment, just like you would for an environmental resource impact study. So things like highway construction, oil and gas pipelines, mining, um, wind and solar farms are big things now. Uh, anything to do with uh, a military base or a national forest, all of that triggers assessment of archaeological materials. And so that's what we call phase one. We go out and we look for archaeological sites in the area that's going to be impacted by whatever construction that's going on. Um, in, the, in the eastern woodland region, we dig little test pits on a grid and screen that dirt for artifacts. We call it shovel testing. And when we find sites, we map out where they are and how far they go on that landscape with the GPS. We report what we found, and then the State Historic Preservation Office, or the SHPO, determines if there's further work that's needed based on what we found in the phase one. Now, if the SHPO thinks that a site needs more work and whoever is in charge of that project, say like the Department of Transportation, decides that they don't want to work around the site that we've identified, then we move on to a phase two. Phase two is an assessment of the data potential for that site. So we're asking like, is there anything on the site that will substantially contribute to our understanding of the past. Sometimes a site only had one or two shovel tests that contained any artifacts whatsoever. It's still a site, it's got artifacts on it, but um, it's such low density that there's not really any, any research potential. Um, you might, you know, have just like a couple of pieces of pottery and some of the waste material from making stew and tools on a site and that's it. And like I said, that's a site, but there's not really enough to actually really say a whole lot in those, in those cases. And if the artifact density is that low, then we might stop there and let the project just proceed. Um, nothing's really going to get damaged in those cases. But if we get something that's culturally diagnostic, like the base of a spear point that we can date to a specific time range, or decorated pottery, or uh, some kind of a cultural feature like a fire pit or an earth oven, something like that, or just a high density of artifacts in general um, in, on the site, then we'll revisit it and figure out if the material that we found in the phase one is actually in good in good context. And to do that, we'll put in some square excavation units so that we can get a good look at the profile of the stratigraphy. I've been on phase two projects in things like cornfields down in Georgia, where all of the sediment had already been eroded off from, you know, decades or in some cases a century of um, of plowing that field. And so all the artifacts are just kind of sitting on top of that clay subsoil and nothing's in its original context anymore. Um, there, there are no more pit features or house structures or post holes left to be excavated. So, you know, in those cases, we'll recommend it not eligible for further research and, and be done with it. But if we revisit a site and put in the units and they show us that there is still a um, intact stratigraphic sequence, and also, if we continue to see uh, like dark diagnostic artifacts or features or things like that, then we will recommend a phase three or a full excavation. And at that point, the project manager might decide uh, to fund a phase two, or they might reconsider avoiding disturbance to the site altogether. Um, avoidance is usually actually what we're going for. We don't want to excavate a site unless it's absolutely necessary. Methods are improving all the time, so the longer we wait to excavate, 
the better the data that we can produce, the better that data is going to be. So like once a site's been excavated, it's gone. We can't go back and re-excavate it. So we will avoid excavating a site if at all possible. Um, excavation and analysis is also really expensive and time consuming. It's not just us archaeologists in the field that you have to pay and provide housing for while we're doing that field work, but it's also the analysis, the paying for the radiocarbon dates, writing the reports, um, and you know the, the curation of the artifacts after everything's been excavated, um, and all of the rest of that post-excavation process. All of that takes, you know, it generally takes a few years to get completed and written up. So convincing a client to work around the site rather than uh, forcing an excavation is usually what happens after a phase two, when those phase two, two sites are eligible for future work. But if a phase two site can't be avoided and it does go to a phase three, then we're doing all the, the kinds of excavation that most people think of when they think of archeology. span So like grids laid out, on the ground with uh, string and nails to, to in blocks for square excavation units. Um, we, you know, map out the post holes to show where the structures were, excavate the storage pits, hearths, ovens, you know, the artifacts, the tools, the bones, the pottery, all of that stuff. And on phase two projects, we're especially interested in those features. It's less the artifacts and much more about the features and what we find in them. I've explained before that an archeological feature is anything that people made that can't be picked up and put into a bag. These usually fall into two main categories. So there's the cluster features and the pit features. And cluster features are the ones that people tend not to think about so much. Um, those are things like piles of fire cracked rock from indirect boiling or caches of stone tools, uh, things like that. Um, individually, those those objects are um, they are artifacts in and of themselves, the FCR and the tools and all that. But when they're together, the spatial relationship between them, is an extra layer of information that uh, that we, we really want and need. Um, and once you disarticulate those, once you pull them apart, that information is lost. So we have to map in and photograph the uh, those clusters of artifacts in order to document what those spatial relationships were like before we pull them out of the ground. Because like, like I said, once you excavate it, it's gone. You can't do it again. Pit features are something something else entirely. Those are um, holes that were dug in the ground by people in the past for certain purposes. So things like fire pits, earth ovens, storage pits, pit houses, um, post holes, those are the, the classic examples. For those, we'll generally cut them in half, or in rare cases, into quarters, so that we can show in the report what the shape was from, from the side as well as from the surface, and also show what kind of internal stratigraphy those pit features had. Generally, we'll screen one half for artifacts and send the other half to be run through a flotation tank. I talked about the, the flotation system in the Patty Joe Watson video before, but flotation is a really efficient and consistent method for recovering plant materials. Um, we, can, we can use those for radiocarbon dates if we can't get a sample uh, directly out of the bottom of the pit. Uh, but we can also look at things like environmental conditions and the way food ways are changing over time and things like that. You have to be really careful with your interpretations of those pit features, though. Whatever you find in them might be in primary context, but it's more likely in secondary context. Um, a specimen's in primary context when it's still where it was when people were using it or the feature itself. So in, in the case of like an earth oven, uh, the charcoal at the bottom is dating when the last time that oven had a fire in it was. And you might get animal bones or anything else that were thrown into the, the pit after the last meal was eaten. But those earth ovens are, are really deep. They're usually a couple of feet deep. And there's going to be a lot of secondary deposition over time. So things like small animals like uh, toads or mice or squirrels or whatever, they might fall in and get trapped. Later visitors to the site might throw away their, their trash into them. Uh, stuff lying around on the surface can get kicked in by people or drug in by animals or washed in by water. I, I've even excavated a fire pit that was reused to bury a dog from the late middle woodland period. And there was a, a storage pit that I did once that was almost filled back in all the way, but the last foot or so had uh, the was used as a grave shaft for the burial of the child. So 
obviously those those two burials happened well after those features had stopped being used for their original purposes as, as cooking pits or uh, in, in the second case as a storage pit. So keeping careful records of exactly where your artifacts and your samples are coming from is extremely important. Otherwise, you're likely to be conflating entirely different time periods. So if you take a, a charcoal sample for a radiocarbon date from near the top of the feature, you're more likely dating something that happened long after that feature was made and actually used. It could be, you know, a thousand years younger, and we wouldn't really have any way to know other than dating, you know, a sample from the bottom of the pit, which, why wouldn't you have just taken the sample from the bottom of the, of the pit in the first place? So the first priority radiocarbon samples need to come from that primary context at the bottom of the pit feature. Ideally from nutshell, actually, because a nutshell was formed and died from a single year. Wood charcoal is different. Each ring of, um, of, of a tree is grown and then dies while the tree is still growing. So uh, a wood sample from the middle of a tree ring is going to have an older radiocarbon date than wood from the very outside of that same tree. So while wood charcoal might be, um, it, it's, it's still useful, it still works for radiocarbon dating, but it's not as precise as burned nutshell. Uh, features uh, are especially important because they tell us about what people were actually doing on a site and where. You might have one side of a site that was used for cooking and another that had maybe a central bonfire in another area that might have had um, uh, house structures or storage structures or something like that. Um, maybe after uh, you've excavated a site, you'll start to see that houses had storage pits inside the structure so that people could keep their belongings private or keep their food to themselves. Or alternatively, you might find that it was more normal to have more communal food storage pits outside of houses. I've worked on uh, one site where we realized after excavating that there's a, an area on the north of the site that had almost all of the, the snail shell dumps in them. So it looks like that area was specifically for processing snails into um, probably some kind of a broth or something like that. This is all stuff that people who go on the weekend and dig up sites looking for artifacts don't record. They're not looking for it. And this is the difference between archaeology and looting. It's all about that data, which usually has nothing to do with the artifacts in and of themselves. It's about those artifacts in context with the rest of the site. Now, even when sites do stop at phase two, we still get a lot of good data from those projects. Uh, we get sequences of artifacts, um, feature data like uh, plant and animal remains coming from the, the fireplaces. But most importantly, we can map out on a landscape where all the sites in a region are and look at how people in the past were changing the way that they were using those landscapes over time. So all that to say, even though you are not really going to hear about it in the news or anything very often, archaeology is being done in every state in the country all year long. Now, that's all I've got for this one. If you've got any questions, uh, you can drop those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.